Hello, Overcomers, and welcome to this episode of Connect Over Coffee. I'm Runsi, the founder of Overcome, and today we are joined by a giant, a global expert in this ovarian cancer space, Dr. David Gershenson. So Dr. Gershenson is Professor of Gynecologic Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and he's regarded as a national and global leader in rare ovarian cancers. As the guru of low-grade serous ovarian cancer, Dr. Gershenson has led and continues to lead groundbreaking research and trials in this space. He is the principal investigator or the co-PI of several clinical trials focused on novel therapeutics for patients with low-grade serious cancers. As you may imagine, we have a lot to chat with Dr. Gershenson today. So join us for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Have your coffee ready. I have mine. And let's chat to Dr. Gershenson about all things low-grade serious ovarian cancers. And if you have any questions as we go along, please type in the comment sections below and we will get it addressed post the discussion. And as I always say, please share this tremendous information with anyone who may benefit from all these great insights Dr. Gershenson is about to share with us. So with that, a huge welcome to you or welcome back to you, Dr. Gershenson, to this episode of Connect Over Coffee. Always a tremendous honor to have you with us. Well, thanks, Renzi. It's it's great to be with you again. It's been, been a while. Yes. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share information with your viewers. Thank on, you. On, mainly on rare ovarian cancers. Yes. So um, bef- I have several questions for you, but before we uh, get along to the uh, the details, can you please tell us uh, a little bit about just, you know, basics on low-grade serious ovarian cancers and what is it, how it presents, what is the typical profile of the individuals who get diagnosed with this type of ovarian cancer and any guidance that you may be able to share with us? Yeah, certainly. So it is a rare uh, ovarian cancer, number one. You know, there are, of the epithelial ovarian cancers, there are four major types, serous, mucinous, endometroid, and clear cell. And maybe we'll talk more about that also later. Serous is the most, far and away, the most common type, but 90% of the serous tumors are high-grade serous, and only about 10% are low-grade serous. So that, that makes it pretty rare and probably in the United States, there's, it's estimated to be somewhere in the range of maybe 2,500 or 3,000 women uh, diagnosed uh, annually with this uh, pretty rare subtype. We've learned a lot about it in the last couple of decades. You know, um, for many years, the grading system, meaning what's, what is the microscopic appearance to make a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, the grading system for serous cancers was grades one, two, and three. So there were three grades, and it was very confusing. We sort of knew that the grade three were the most aggressive, and the grade ones were the ones that were more indolent or slow-growing, but grade two was very confusing. We didn't really understand where that fit. And in the 1990s, MD Anderson pathologists began to refine the criteria for diagnosis of serous cancer, and eventually uh, put it into two categories, a binary grading system of low grade and high grade. Um, And then in 2004, this was published. So once that happened, it really accelerated uh, the field in terms of uh, advances, in terms of research studies, et cetera. you know, so it's, it's it, number one, as I said, it's more slow growing or indolent. And the prognosis for women who have low grade serous carcinoma is much better than for high grade serous carcinoma. Early on, we learned that uh, low grade serous carcinoma is not as sensitive to the most common treatment for this disease, which is chemotherapy. Certainly, surgery plays the same role as it does in all of the ovarian cancers in terms, usually in terms of the primary treatment and then followed by systemic therapy with some exceptions. So we learned that chemotherapy was was not as sensitive. Um, We learned that uh, the the average age for low-grade serous carcinoma was significantly younger than for high-grade. So the average age in the typical high-grade serous carcinoma is in the 60s, 
for low-grade serous carcinoma, it's in the mid-40s. So we were seeing a lot of younger women, even as young as teenagers or women in their 20s uh, with this disease. Um, and then we also learned, we began to learn a lot more about the biology of low-grade serous carcinoma. So we know, for instance, that the estrogen receptor is positive in over 90% of, of the tumors with low-grade serous carcinoma, much uh, similar to hormone uh, uh, positive breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And we also learned about something about the molecular biology of the tumor in that what's called the MAP kinase pathway, which is a signaling pathway, is upregulated in about 50% of low-grade serous carcinomas. Whereas in high-grade serous carcinoma, the hallmark pretty much is a P53 mutation. Uh, so the, the molecular biology of those two uh, serous carcinomas is, is very is very different. Thank you, Dr. Gershenson. So um, before we get into the details, in your um, opinion, what are the top five major highlights on low-grade serous ovarian cancers that you would like to share with us? Yeah. Well, so there are, there are many. I'm not sure I can pick out the five top, but I'll try. Um, number one, because these are so rare, what we have found that it's really important um, if a woman is diagnosed with low-grade serous carcinoma, the pathology diagnosis sometimes in about 15 to 20 percent of cases may be mistaken or an error. So it, I think it's really important to recommend a second opinion on the pathology to send it to, to you know, and there are a limited number of experts throughout the world uh, on this rare type. So I think to get a second opinion to confirm that in fact it is low-grade serous carcinoma and not another type is really good. Secondly, to get a second opinion about uh, the uh, standard treatment. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's true of both in newly diagnosed patients as well as women who have a recurrence because uh, the, the treatment options are many. And I think there are a limited number of experts in this rare tumor that can provide, I think, very important information. So a second opinion on the management. Um, the second thing I would say is about 20% of low-grade serous carcinomas uh, are diagnosed after a woman has had a prior diagnosis of what's called a serous borderline tumor. Serous borderline tumors sort of are between benign and malignant, but they are thought to be sometimes precursors to a later diagnosis of low-grade serous carcinoma. This so is, is, not, it, is it kind of similar to the stage zero breast cancer? Just well, a, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. But it's mainly a, a histologic diagnosis. If the, if the serous borderline tumor diagnosis previously was limited to the ovary, there really is minimal risk of anything later on. Mm -hmm. But if it's associated with what we call peritoneal implants, so these small implants in the abdominal area or in the peritoneum, which occurs in about 30% of serous borderline tumors, then a woman has an increased lifetime risk of subsequently developing low-grade serous carcinoma. And when we see that, we recommend much closer monitoring for those women. Okay. Um, so that's important. Thirdly, I already mentioned the prognosis is significantly better. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the average survival with this disease is in the 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 12 year range, which is much better than high grade serous carcinoma. Um, but uh, that is important for women to understand. On the other hand, low grade serous carcinoma is diagnosed just like high grade serous carcinoma, most, most frequently in stage three. So it's not like it's detected earlier than the more aggressive cell types. Um, we also know that about 70 to 80 percent of women who have low-grade serous carcinoma may at some point develop a recurrence. Mm -hmm. So that's another issue. But the good news is there are many options that we can talk about. Um, as I mentioned, over the last uh, couple decades, we have clearly defined the disease microscopically. 
We know a lot more about the molecular biology, and we also know a lot more about prognostic factors. So we know that a, a primary surgery in which all of the visible tumor can be resected or removed is very important. We actually know a little bit about age and, and uh, it kind of uh, counterintuitively, younger patients actually don't fare quite as well as older patients mm -hmm. uh, in this disease. And that's, that's again, similar to hormone uh, positive breast cancer. Uh, we know that um, uh, if, if a woman's tumor has one of these MAP kinase mutations, KRAS most, most commonly, BRAF, NRAS, that their prognosis is somewhat better than if, if there are no mutations, which also seems a little counterintuitive. So we've learned a lot about this in the last several years. And then finally, I would say another important point to make is when we first began to study this 20 years ago, we were just performing retrospective studies based on prior patients. But over the last 15 years, a number of clinical trials were developed and were completed uh, in, this, in this rare tumor, which is, I think, a, uh, also a success story. So those would be some of the important points I would make. And those are all fabulous points. Thank you for breaking it down for us. So before we get into, you know, because this session is focused more on low-grade series, I would just ask you uh, to give us a very high-level overview of other types of rare ovarian cancers. And um, just if you could share their characteristics and what should our overcomers know about them? Yeah, important question. So in no particular order, so malignant ovarian germ cell tumors occur in very, in girls and young women. So the average age is like 16. Um, and they're also very rare, about 5% of all ovarian tumors. The good news is that as early as the late 70s, early 1980s, uh, we found uh, and others found that chemotherapy, uh, these tumors are very exquisitely sensitive to chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So the cure rate with these tumors is over 90%. Nice. Um, the other thing is they only, they usually only involve one ovary, not both ovaries. Mm -hmm. So fertility, uh, sparing surgery, fertility preservation is possible in the vast majority of these young patients. Uh, so that's a that's a, just a little bit about uh, germ cell tumors. But the other thing I would mention, now we're in a mode in which we're trying to actually reduce the aggressiveness of uh, treatment. And so we're trying to figure out, are there patients the, whom we can select for uh, less less treatment, meaning sometimes just surgery without any chemotherapy following the surgery? And the answer probably is yes, and there are ongoing clinical trials in this rare subtype. A second uh, rare tumor is granulosa cell tumor. It's a, you know, it's still about 5%. Uh, there are certainly advocacy groups around the United States I know of that uh, women, uh, groups of women with this rare tumor. Um, what we found in granulosa cell tumor is the impact of uh, multiple surgeries is much greater than we originally thought. And so probably the most effective treatment for this disease, if a woman uh, is treated and then develops a recurrence or a second recurrence or a third recurrence, is repeat surgeries. Granulosa cell tumors are only, I would say, modestly sensitive to either chemotherapy or hormonal or endocrine therapies. So we've, we've got a lot to learn in this tumor. Also, we, we, um, we understand very little about the molecular biology right now of granulosa cell tumors. So there's a lot of room for improvement, and it has, but it has been a somewhat frustrating uh, group of tumors to treat. Uh, and, and there are some, some of my younger colleagues are really working on this in this area and I think we'll make progress over the next several years. And then um, I would mention uh, some of the other rare epithelial ovarian cancers. So clear cell carcinoma and endometrioid carcinoma uh, frequently arise from endometriosis, endometriosis being a benign 
condition that uh, affects many women uh, within the United States, certainly, uh, it, but it is a benign process. But about 1% of endometriosis cases will at some point develop a malignancy. And again, it's usually clear cell or endometrioid. We've learned a lot about the molecular biology of these two subtypes. Clear cell is probably the most aggressive of the um, rare subtypes of epithelial ovarian cancer. But in the last few years, there's been a major advance in that we've learned that immunotherapy yeah. may be particularly effective against clear cell carcinoma. And there are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing in this area, but that's one rare subtype where immunotherapy really looks like it's more effective. The low-grade endometrioid carcinomas can be treated many times with, uh, like low-grade serous carcinoma, with endocrine or hormonal therapy rather than chemotherapy. So that's something uh, we've learned. Mucinous uh, carcinoma is another rare epithelial ovarian type. It usually uh, presents in stage one, which is good, which means it's usually curable. But when it is spread outside the ovary, it's very difficult to treat. We've made some progress in treating it uh, with different chemotherapies, using chemotherapy that's directed mainly against gastrointestinal tumors because it microscopically looks very much like, for instance, colorectal cancer in many cases. So we've made some progress in the chemotherapy, but again, we've got a long way to go in terms of understanding mucinous carcinomas. So those are just a few uh, kind of high level uh, features and facts about some of the other rare subtypes. Perfect. Um, just going back um, to you, you mentioned a lot and you shared a lot on this, just a few rapid fire questions on this. Oh, yeah. you, um, you mentioned endometriosis, about 1% of those developing into the rare ovarian cancers, right? So in terms of, you know, knowledge, uh, in terms of our primary care, or even the the OBGYNs who are treating our, you know, our overcomers um, at that setting, how many of them actually know that this might develop into something? In the sense, what I'm asking is what kind of awareness is given to the patients for surveillance and that something like this could potentially develop? I, I mean, are patients do patients know about this or are, are they told or, because to me, it, this is an opportunity for awareness and perhaps even prevention going forward. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would say, although I don't know for certain, cause I haven't done a, a survey, my guess is that very few uh, obstetrician gynecologists are telling their patients that there's a 1% chance of developing a malignancy in the endometriosis, that would be my guess. Yeah. Um, because it is so so uncommon. Um, and you know, in the, what are the symptoms? The common symptoms of endometriosis are infertility and pain and pelvic pain. Pelvic pain can also be associated with ovarian cancer. So I th I think you know it's a matter of uh, close surveillance. And if some a woman who has endometriosis is developing enlargement of implants in the abdomen or masses are occurring, that certainly could be a signal that a further investigation should be performed and, and possibly biopsy or further surgery. But yeah, it's, it's a challenging area, uh, mainly because it is so uncommon that, that one would develop a malignancy. But we do see it in a referral center like MD Anderson we see these kinds of patients that are coming in, but fortunately, they're, they're few and far between because it's just 1%, but it, it's difficult. And to yeah, tell. yeah. And then, you know, I was just thinking about that 1%, right? I mean, it is not zero. So just, just the awareness of it for our patient community would be just a start. It's a good start just to know that. So thank you for sharing that. And also going back to the granulosa cell tumors, you said surgery is is probably the best treatment for this type of cancer. So on an average, patients who have this type of diagnosis, um, how many surgeries do they go through in their you know, whole lifetime or life cycle of, of their cancer? 
So fortunately, most granulosa cell tumors are uh, diagnosed in stage one, confined to the ovary. And usually, they on, again, they only involve one ovary, not both ovaries. So fertility preservation is possible. So in stage one, the most common stage in granulosa cell tumor, the recurrence rate is only, in the, is only as high as at highest 20%. Okay, so most of those patients are, under, gonna one, uh, are going to undergo one surgery. But uh, those who recur may recur, once somebody recurs with granulosa cell tumor, they may have multiple recurrences. So typically it's not unusual for women who develop a recurrence to have two, three, four, even five surgeries. Uh, and again, and you know, in the early days we thought, you know, that does, does that really make sense? But I think we've learned in the last uh, 10 to 20 years, it does make sense. Not that systemic treatment is completely ineffective. It's not, but it's not, nearly as effective as we, we need it to be. And so that's, again, an area of intense study right now. But, you know, two to four surgeries would, would not be uncommon. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so you briefly mentioned, um, the, you know, all the great advances that are happening in the field of low, low grade serous, right? So I was mm -hmm. reading about the role of the MEK inhibitors, right? Uh, in the treatment of patients with uh, low grade serous ovarian cancer. So um, tell us a little bit about this MEK inhibitor therapy and should this be considered for all low grade serous ovarian cancer patients in frontline as well as in the recurrent setting? Okay, great, great question. Um, so MEK inhibitors were developed by uh, several different uh, pharmaceutical companies several years ago. They target the genes within this MAP kinase pathway, MEK1 and MEK2 uh, genes. Um, and so they began to be studied somewhere around 2008, 2010. And the first uh, MEK inhibitor that was studied was selumetinib. Uh, a drug. Uh, in a phase two trial, about 52 women were treated with recurrent low-grade serous carcinoma, and the response rate was 15%, which is not bad, uh, better than many other agents for this disease. And But we found that there was no real correlation with uh, having a mutation within this MAP kinase pathway. So that was the first study. And then there were two second generation large trials, phase three randomized trials. One was the MILO trial with a MEK inhibitor called vinimetinib. That trial actually uh, randomized women to the MEK inhibitor versus standard of care. And standard of care was one of three different chemotherapy drugs. And that that trial closed early because they actually didn't see a signal that showed that the MEK inhibitor was any better than standard of care in that trial. But there were some design flaws with that trial. And actually, benimetinib did show a response rate at least of 14 15%, and even higher when they went back and looked at the data later. But then the GOG-281 trial studied, again, a third MEK inhibitor called trametinib, and that trial was positive. It did show that compared to standard of care, uh, the progression-free survival was much better, 13 months versus 7.2 months. The response rates were much better, 20, uh, you know, 26% versus 6.2%. And so that, that drug actually, uh, it's not been FDA approved because the company uh, Novartis was not uh, for various reasons interested in pursuing that, but it now is on the NCCN guideline compendium and most women in the United States are able to get, gain access to it off a clinical trial without with their insurance uh, cover, covering it. Um, so that's a, a short version of the kind of the history of the development of the MEK inhibitors. They have not really been tested in, you ask about frontline treatment. Yes. They've not been tested yet in frontline treatment, but at some point, I'm sure they will be. But all of the trials were done for in women who had recurrent low-grade serous carcinoma. So I think 
moving forward, uh, there are a lot of opportunities with the MEK inhibitors. Uh, I think we'll see uh, in the future combination trials with a MEK inhibitor plus another drug. Uh, that would be um, something to uh, anticipate in the not too distant future. Okay. So Mike, you know, it's a great segue into my next question, which was basically focusing on the, the MEK inhibitor therapy, but you mentioned that FDA has not approved it yet. Um, so in how are we offering this to the, is it in the, in the setting of a clinical trial that the patients are getting this drug or Tell no, us a they, more about they that. Actually, get the drug off the clinical trial because it's on the NCCN compendium. Correct. Yeah. That's that's uh, insurance companies utilize that to determine whether they'll they'll fund it. Okay. So no, they don't have to be on a clinical trial. I wouldn't say it's a hundred percent, but in my experience, over ninety percent of women can gain access to the drug without going on a clinical trial. And have and having their insurance cover it because it's a very expensive drug, mm -hmm. somewhere in the uh, range of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per month. Wow. Okay. Now, the reason it's not FDA approved, it it could be FDA FDA approved potentially, but the company, as I mentioned, was not interested in pursuing that, probably for financial mm -hmm. reasons because it's a drug for a rare tumor. You know, it is approved, it is FDA approved for melanoma. And it's been FDA approved for melanoma for several years, okay. which is a more common uh, condition. But uh, they just made that, that was a, a, a corporate decision that was made. But it is, it is very available to women. And uh, off the top of your head, how what percentage of women right now are on this drug, you think, with low-grade serous? Well, if for women who develop recurrent uh, low-grade serous ovarian cancer, most of them are going to get it at one point or another. Okay. There's no standard sequence. You know, we've got lots of different treatments for recurrent low-grade serous carcinoma. We have a number of chemotherapy drugs. We've got a number of endocrine or hormonal drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, Avastin or Bevacizumab is active in low-grade the MEK inhibitors, and then there are some clinical trials. But at some point, most women will will get it. You asked earlier, I didn't answer it, whether it's, uh, is it recommended for all women? Yes. What, we, what we found is that if a woman's tumor contains a mutation in this MAP kinase pathway, most commonly KRAS, then the, her chances of responding to trametinib tend to be higher than if the tumor does not contain a mutation. But even women whose tumors have no mutations may still respond to the drug. So we don't discriminate about recommending it, whether the, you know, the tumor does or does not contain a mutation, if that makes sense. Yes. Thank you. Um, so we, you talked a little bit about chemotherapy, hormonal therapy for, for um, rare ovarian cancer. So it seems like for low-grade serious, there's still a question whether chemotherapy in the frontline setting should be replaced by hormonal therapy for overcomers with advanced stage disease. So please share your thoughts on this and any new information or advances that we should all be aware of. Yeah, that's an important question and one that is is out there and many women ask, and there's some myths associated with that topic. So yes, early on, as I mentioned, probably by 2006 at the uh, latest, we, we began to understand that low-grade serous carcinoma is not as sensitive as high-grade serous carcinoma to paclitaxel, carboplatinum chemotherapy, and other chemotherapies. However, it doesn't mean that some patients do not derive benefit and do not respond because they do. Some patients do. So some women have kind of interpreted that uh, as meaning it, chemotherapy is completely ineffective in low-grade serous carcinoma. That's not the case. So that is a myth that I want to try to dispel. But it is less sensitive in general. We, but we've, we've uh, cared for many women who receive chemotherapy and have excellent responses to chemotherapy. 
Um, so that that's a, an important point. Now, up until about 2015, 2017, the standard treatment for a newly diagnosed uh, low-grade serous carcinoma was paclitaxel carboplatinum chemotherapy, period. Six cycles of treatment, and then go on surveillance, follow the patients. And we were, again, we're seeing that up to 80% of them were developing a recurrence. In 2017, two retrospective studies were published, one from MD Anderson, in which we uh, reported a number of women, over 200 women, uh, some of whom had received chemotherapy initially, but then went on to endocrine or, or hormonal maintenance therapy. And we, we, we saw that the results and the findings and the outcomes for those women were much better than if they just received chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. The other study was from Johns Hopkins in which they treated patients, primary surgery again, with no chemotherapy, they gave them hormonal therapy, and they also saw some pretty good results. This uh, subsequently um, resulted in a large phase three randomized clinical trial that's ongoing right now, which is NRG GY019. This is a clinical trial for women who've undergone primary cytoreductive surgery and have been diagnosed with stage two, three, or four low-grade serous carcinoma. They're randomized to one of those two options. So half the women will receive either, uh, half the women will receive paclitaxel carboplatinum chemotherapy for six cycles and then transition to letrozole, yeah. uh, an endocrine agent, and the other half will receive just letrozole without chemotherapy. That's a very large trial, 450 women. Thus far, 200 women have been accrued on the trial. So we've got probably about another three years till we complete that trial. And Amanda Fader from Johns Hopkins is the principal investigator of that trial. I'm working with her on the trial. So it's an important question. And if we can show that the uh, hormonal therapy alone is just as effective as the chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, then of course that will mean we can completely abandon chemotherapy right. for frontline treatment. That's the hope, but I think we'll have to see, uh, you know, we, we need to obviously see what the final results show if that if that answers your question. Yes, it does. And it's a, it sounds like a practice, potentially practice changing trial that is, uh, that could be critical for our overcomers. So you mentioned out of the 450, you have recruited about 200. So about half of the slots are still open. So tell yes. us how our overcomers who may be interested in signing up, how they may go about doing yeah. so. Yes. So the trial is sponsored by the uh, NRG Oncology, which is a NCI sponsored cooperative group. So there are multiple sites throughout the United States where this trial is open. MD Anderson is one of the sites. So for women who live in this area, yeah. uh, certainly uh, they can, they, if they have a newly diagnosed stage two, three or four low grade serous carcinoma, I would encourage them to consider the trial and they can see one of us, and we're happy to, to do that. But there are many other sites as open, as I say, all, all throughout the United States. So it would be a matter of just, uh, this is on clinicaltrials.gov. They can, look, they can uh, look at that up there, and they can see where the sites are. Uh, but certainly, if anybody has a question and wants to contact us, we can help facilitate that uh, as well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So um, we are speaking of clinical trials, uh, we know that, as you mentioned, there are quite a few pro promising clinical trials that are happening in this space or about to read out now or in the next few years. Um, you know, what would you like to share about the clinical trials that are ongoing that hold the most promise that you would like to share with our overcomers? Yeah. So still for this rare tumor, Clinical trials are unfortunately few and far between, but there are two clinical trials I would highlight right now that are ongoing. Uh, both are, one's actually just completed and the other one is going to complete in the not too distant future. So the first trial is the Veristem trial, which is a trial of a drug that is a MEK inhibitor, but it's a dual inhibitor. It's a MEK 
RAF inhibitor. So it actually inhibits two genes within that MAP kinase pathway, not just one. And um, in this trial, it's randomized, but some of the women in the trial are also receiving a second drug, which is a, called a FAK, FAK, FAK inhibitor, that they found in preclinical studies may actually increase the effectiveness of the dual MECRAF inhibitor. So that's a trial that's, again, it's in, in multiple sites throughout the United States. Um, it is open. Right now, it's open only, I think, for women whose tumors contain a KRAS mutation. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the eligibility criteria. So that's a trial. We're looking forward to the results. The preliminary results look very promising. Um, and in, is it possible it may even be better than trametinib? It may have fewer side effects. Um, so that's, that's an important trial. A second trial that, as I said, just completed is a trial of um, letrozole plus what's called a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So uh, this is for women with re also with recurrent low-grade serous carcinoma. So it's using the drug letrozole, which we've known for many years is effective. CDK4-6 inhibitors have been studied in breast cancer for several years. There are multiple clinical trials that have been reported. And what, it, what they've shown is that the CDK4-6 inhibitors increase or boost the effectiveness of the endocrine therapy. So they're it's much more effective in, when you use both drugs rather than just the endocrine therapy. There are three FDA-approved um, CDK4-6 inhibitors uh, for breast cancer one from the from Lilly, one from um, Pfizer, and a third one from Novartis. So we did this trial in, with using the Novartis drug ribocyclob uh, in combination with letrozole. The results uh, are going to be uh, reported out at the SGO meeting in March of this year, so only in a couple months. Mm -hmm. And uh, it look, does look like, I can't really discuss the the results yet, because they're embargoed, but it does look very promising as well. So that's another strategy. We need more trials with CDK4-6 inhibitors. Again, they're not FDA approved for ovarian. So the patients, it's very difficult to get these. Once we actually report out and the study is published though, yeah. the hope is that at the very least, this will also like trametinib go on the NCCN compendium. Right women will be able to gain access to uh, these drugs uh, without without FDA approval. That's wonderful. So so much promise in, on the horizon. I love it. So um, so we, you talked about, you know, we talked briefly about recurrence, right? Um, you know, um, so tell us a little more about what percentage of the uh, low-grade serious ovarian cancer see their cancers coming back and what are the options available to them at that point? And you also mentioned that immunotherapy is only uh, effective in, in very, even uh, on the subset of the rare ovarian cancer, it's not as effective for all of them. So shed a little bit of light on that as well. Yeah. So historically, uh, for women who have stage two, three, or four low-grade serous carcinoma, the most common stages, yes. the most common stage being stage three, historically, the recurrence rates have been in the 70 to 80% range, which obviously is not good, and we would like to see that reduce significantly. Uh, but with some, there's some preliminary information that we published using um, either chemotherapy followed by letrozole treatment or letrozole by itself in, in a few women in which we've preliminarily found that maybe the recurrence rate is, has been reduced to maybe 50%. Mm -hmm. So that would represent certainly some progress, sure. but it is preliminary and we need to follow it out longer. Um, but there's hope there. The other thing that this preliminary study showed was that if a woman is uh, treated primarily with surgery followed by either chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, or hormonal therapy, 
that if they go five years from diagnosis and they've not recurred, we think the chances of recurrence that at that point are very low. We've had only so far only one woman out of 99 women who've recurred um, of the 99 patients in the study, about half of them have recurred so far, but only one has recurred after five years and she recurred in year six. Mm -hmm. So that's good news uh, for women that if they make it five years without a recurrence, we think they're, they're looking potentially at cure. The second part of good news is now, as I mentioned earlier, there are several different options for recurrence. And while we don't have a standard way to sequence them, uh, there are multiple chemotherapy regimens, multiple endocrine therapy regimens, bevacizumab or Avastin, and then MEK inhibitors. And there are some clinical trials as well. The clinical trials, other than the ones I mentioned earlier, are not necessarily exclusively for women with low-grade serous carcinoma. But for instance, uh, I mentioned KRAS is the most common mutation uh, in low-grade serous carcinomas. There are now drug, and there are many different types of KRAS mutations. So there now are designer drugs that have been developed by pharmaceuticals that target a very specific KRAS mutation. So there's some clinical trials with those. Uh, so that would be if a woman has a rare type of, for instance, KRAS mutation, she may be a candidate for one of these early clinical trials. Um, so there are many different, op but there are many different options. The other part of good news is even worst case scenario, if a woman does develop recurrence, a recurrent low-grade serous carcinoma, because we have so many therapies and because the disease is generally fairly slow growing, mm -hmm. they may live for many, many years and may even live a normal lifespan even if they have recurrence. That's promising. Thank you for sharing that with us. So um, so just switching gears, I mean, we were talking about clinical trials and I thought I would ask you with your vast experience, I'm sure you have seen clinical trials where they have failed, right? So um, tell us what you learned from that experience when clinical trials fail and what should our overcomers know when they're involved in such a trial that has not done so well? Yeah, great question. So number one, I think we've learned a lot in the last several years. One of the, one of the important lessons we've learned is when a clinical trial is in the early development, it's really best to have the input of patient advocates uh, because they can, they really see things from a very different perspective and can be very helpful in the design of a clinical trial. Number one, I think that's very important. The tr uh, I'll give you an example of a clinical trial that was an abysmal failure, and that was a trial that was we started to develop in around 2007. I think it was a, a large trial for mucinous carcinoma of the ovary. Uh, it was, and this trial was being developed primarily in the UK. Uh, one of my uh, very esteemed colleagues in London, along with uh, me, uh, we developed a trial because we knew from the beginning, as I mentioned earlier, that mucinous carcinoma is very resistant or insensitive to the typical types of chemotherapy. So we wanted to do a trial in which uh, women, after they had primary surgery, if they had metastatic or disease spread, they were randomized to either the standard chemotherapy, taxol carboplatinum, or to a GI chemotherapy regimen like colo, a colorectal cancer regimen. Um, and then there was a secondary randomization to Avastin or Bevacizumab. So this was, a, a I think, a well-designed trial. Um, it was a large trial with, I think, somewhere around uh, 200 or to 300 women were going to be enrolled in this trial. But what we didn't realize at the time the trial was designed was the rarity of, of metastatic mucinous carcinoma of the ovary. Because again, I mentioned earlier, it can be confused pathologically with colorectal cancer, which is a very common cancer in men and women. Um, so we underestimated the rarity of the disease. And therefore, when we started the trial, 
the accrual was extremely slow and the trial was stopped early uh, because we just couldn't accrue patients. And we couldn't accrue patients because we didn't at that point in time understand just how rare mucinous carcinoma was. So it was a failed trial. We, we got almost no answers from the trial. It was unfortunate, um, but that's, that's an example. So feasibility is one of the, I can't stress enough how important feasibility is. So there are some rare gynecologic cancers that are so, so rare that you just uh, hardly, you can't really mount a meaningful clinical trial for them. You have to rely on either retrospective data or a single arm trial that will take several years to complete to learn anything. Um, and so feasibility is just such an important factor when you're designing a trial. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Gershenson. So um, another question, curious question that I had is um, you mentioned that, you know, typically um, the low-grade serous or some of the rare ovarian cancers may impact younger women, right? So um, yet we all know that when the younger women walk into the doctor, the, the doctor's office and they talk about their symptoms, they tend to get overlooked because of their age, right? And the symptoms are still vague, whatever the, the ovarian cancer type may be, the symptoms are not specific. So it, it, this is a conflicting situation where you you're saying clinically younger women get diagnosed yet your younger women get overlooked at the primary care or the OBGYN's office with the symptoms because they don't think it's cancer of any kind. So then in that situation, how do you think, or what would be your message of awareness on this type of cancer, especially to the younger women, how could they advocate for themselves and, when it comes to receiving timely and effective treatment? What, what are your thoughts on that? Great question. I'm not, I certainly don't have the perfect answer, but what I would, a couple, I'd say a couple of things. Number one, this is most applicable. If you think of a, a ovarian cancers, mm -hmm. it's applicable to low-grade serous carcinoma, certainly, but it's also applicable for malignant germ cell tumors. It's, it's applicable for granulosa cell tumors that can occur also in very young women, particularly. Uh, you're right. When they, they they probably initially they'll have, you know, one of the symptoms: abdominal discomfort or pain, constipation, bloating, urinary frequency, kind of vague things that could be caused by many many other uh, conditions. They see their OBGYN. Um, you know, I think they number one they need to be assertive about their care. So. If they're presenting with those kinds of symptoms, not all even not a, all OBGYNs will even do a CA-125 uh, blood test. That's one thing that may give a clue that if it's very high, it may point in the direction of malignancy. They may or may not do an ultrasound. That would be another important test to request if you're having persistent symptoms. But at that, and then so what happens practically speaking is you're right. The OBGYNs are thinking a young patient. It's they don't even think about malignancy. Yeah. They may do surgery to remove a, an ovarian ma a mass or cyst that they believe is benign. Mm -hmm. It turns out to be malignant. The surgery itself may be performed not ideally, right. uh, and so then they have to have a second surgery. Yeah. So they, the other thing they need to think about in, in addition to really as being assertive and requesting CA-125 and ultrasound is if there's any question at all or they're uncomfortable to request a second opinion with a gynecologic oncologist. Right. Um, I think that's another important uh, aspect. It is true, though. Most of these masses in young women are going to be benign. Yes. But but. You just have to, so it's not perfect, but those are kind of some tips I would give uh, women. I think all physicians, all physicians have some tunnel vision. They know what they know. They don't know what they don't know, <laughs> right? 
And and they, we, we all have tunnel vision uh, of some type or another, you know, and working in a place like MD Anderson, everything is cancer until proven otherwise. Yeah. But then the OBGYNs, it sometimes can be on the opposite end of the spectrum. So you really have to just be an advocate for yourself. Right. You know, there is no effective screening for any type of ovarian cancer. So when I'm not at recommending asymptomatic women have CA125 and ultrasounds, although some do, that's not what I'm saying. But if they're having symptoms and they go to their OBGYN, those would be two key tests, as well as the potential for a second opinion with a gynecologic oncologist. I think in that way, some of the air, medical errors could be avoided. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that with us, because like I said, I mean, this is always that perception that younger women, like you said, this is not cancer, this is something else, but the self-advocacy will go a long way in kind of, you know, trying to um, address the situation. So I've asked you a lot of questions, Dr. Gershenson, what have I missed so far that you would like to share? You've missed almost nothing. You're you're a great uh, interviewer, uh, for sure. Um, and I think just what I've already mentioned, yeah, you know, the, unfortunately, there's no effective screening. And I think that's an important point to uh, that can't be overstated. Uh, unfortunately, maybe someday there will be. And I think there are still many studies looking for um, a, a methodology for screening for ovarian cancer. Uh, but also, again, this issue about all physicians have have uh, shortcomings and you just have to be your own advocate. Uh, my wife, you know, not to get too personal, but my wife is going, not, not with the ovarian mass or, but a thyroid issue. And, uh, you know, she's encountered the same sort of a phenomenon where some doctors are going to be, have a little bit tunnel vision and be looking in one direction when maybe they should be looking in the other direction. Um, so it, it's a common, no matter what the condition is, uh, I think women will encounter this sort of a thing. But those, I would just restate those important points. And staying on the personal note, um, tell us how you found your calling in caring for patients with uh, low-grade serous ovarian cancer. Yeah, it's sort of a long story. Uh, when I was a fellow at MD Anderson way back in the late 70s, um, I cared for a couple of uh, young women who had a rare cancer, not low-grade serous, but it was uh, they had malignant germ cell tumors. And back then in the, uh, in the late 70s, cisplatinum, uh, the platinum drugs had not been uh, fully developed. They were in clinical trials. And the treatments for malignant germ cell tumors were not that great. And these women did not uh, did not survive. And that really uh, piqued my interest in figuring out, gee, there must be a better way. And then cisplatinum came along at, during the time I was a fellow. And as I said, now the cure rate's over 90% because of the many investigators who made progress in this area. So that was my initial interest in rare tumors. And uh, I did a number of studies there. Then I became interested in sex cord stromal tumors, which includes granulosa cell tumors. And we reported a number of studies there. And then in the 1990s, uh, Elvio Silva, a, a pathology colleague of mine, and I became interested in serous borderline tumors, but, but serous borderline tumors that were associated with these peritoneal implants. And we saw that some of these women, maybe 20, 30 percent, were eventually developing a malignancy later on, maybe five years later, 10 years later. And that was very, uh, very interesting to us. So we studied those kinds of tumors for about 10 years. And then that sort of transitioned into, well, what were they, what was the malignancy they were developing? It was low-grade serous carcinoma. So then that led to this refinement of the uh, grading system, the histologic grading system, and then on to retrospective clinical studies and then clinical trials. So it's been a kind of a, a long process uh, in with a longstanding interest in a variety of different rare ovarian cancers. 
Wonderful. Thank you for sharing your inspiration with us. Uh, speaking of inspiration, you know, I mean, all of the work that you do, that we do is is in honor of our overcomers, right? Overcomers worldwide. So today we want to dedicate this episode uh, to and your knowledge and your expertise to a few of our overcomers and every episode going forward we'll be doing so. I sent you a few names. So would you do the honors of dedicating this episode to the overcomers that, uh, that you know, that you would like to so uh, I'd be, be happy to um, so th those overcomers are Sally S Louise S Tammy E Sharon C and Kathy U Thank you so very much, Dr. Gershenson. I know that all of them will be watching and they'll be so honored to have this uh, dedication from you. We appreciate it. So um, just in closing, we have had a beautiful, tremendous conversation as we get to the top of the hour. I just wanted to close out by asking you uh, what message of overcoming would you like to share with our audience? Yeah, so I would um, <clears throat> probably end with, uh, with hope to talk about a little bit about hope. I think if you look at the uh, low-grade serous carcinoma, there's been a lot of progress over the last two decades. And I think we're gonna make much more in the future. I think because it's a rare cancer, you know, what we initially found uh, years ago was nobody was very interested in it. Yeah. So patients were interested, but pharma companies, big pharma was not very interested because they're rare. They don't produce a lot of revenue. Even the National Cancer Institute uh, was not that interested in funding studies for rare cancers initially, um, so on and so forth. That's all changed now. So there, first of all, there are many physicians and investigators who are now interested in rare cancers because they see the progress that's already been made. The pharma companies, I think, have an increased inter interest now in developing new drugs. The National Cancer Institute is uh, has uh, is reinvigorated, I think, and is more commonly funding some of the studies for rare cancers. So that's one point. The second point I would make is that advocacy organizations like Overcome are so important. You know, they've been really uh, critical in terms of awareness, education, fundraising, yes. uh, for sure. And, and Overcome has done a great job. But, and they've partnered with, uh, in many instances, they've partnered with uh, physicians and investigators as Overcome has in many ways. What I would like to see moving forward though, is I would like to see uh, advocacy groups get more involved in advocacy or lobbying of FDA, yeah. National Cancer Institute, pharma, pharmaceutical companies, to be much stronger in, in the advocacy to make them aware that we need, that the treatments are limited, we need new treatments, uh, we need new studies, we need to learn a lot more. We've just scratched the surface yeah. with a lot of these rare ovarian cancers. And so, and there are, I think there is increased advocacy now, and I think it will only uh, grow over the next uh, decade or so. But that I think is something we, we really as physicians want to partner with the groups and want to see uh, much greater advocacy. Thank you so much, Dr. Gershenson. This was such a beautiful conversation. It was always this, your, your, uh, conversations with you are always insightful, but I felt that today's conversation was particularly beautiful because we uh, we touched on hope, we touched on you know advancements, we touched on things we have done and failed and learned from. So it has been, and also your we learned about your inspiration about this groundbreaking work that you have been doing for the past like fifty years in this space. So thank you for sharing your inspiration and your knowledge with us today. And overcomers, hope this episode was 
that's beneficial for you. I know, as I always say, I learned so much from all these experts that, that um, you know, come to us and grace us with their time and knowledge. So learned a lot from Dr. Gershenson today, as always. So uh, please share this uh, information far and wide with anyone who may benefit. And we will see you back for the next episode of Connect Over Coffee very soon. Until then, you keep overcoming. Thank you and bye. Thank you, Rosie.